In today's show, new AirPods and MacBooks due later this year according to Economic Daily Times. I'm Mike Cave Dave and I simplify Apple so that everything just works for you and if you want the latest Apple leaks, news and rumours every weekday at 12 UTC, like the video, subscribe to the channel and ring my bell. And we asked you yesterday for your Mac setups and your iPad setups and we asked you for video questions and you guys have delivered. So we'll be getting to that stuff straight after the news. Economic Daily Times is reporting that shipment momentum is significantly stronger from the third quarter of the year, which begins tomorrow. So so it's not really news when you say, oh, new MacBooks, they could be shipping as soon as, well, not not before today. Not before today, they're not going to be released earlier. This is one of those things where, where you can tell that a lot of the Apple press is really struggling for news because this is being reported by Mac rumours, but they are basically saying that, yes, there have been delays, but basically as soon as now, yeah, any time, they could start to ship this stuff. So that's pretty interesting, I guess, from a really like <laughs> vague news kind of point of view. But regardless, we know that these things are coming. We know that they're on their way pretty soon. We just don't have a date, which is the annoying part. But we are expecting new AirPods and new MacBook Pros. The new AirPods, we don't really know a great deal about what's going to be different about them other than it looks like the third generation AirPods are likely to have some kind of spatial audio built in that's a little bit better. They're probably not going to have, have active noise cancelling, but they are going to have the new design that is a lot closer to the current AirPods Pro. Now, when it comes to the MacBook Pros, we are expecting and we have obviously renders from Renderboy Apple Tomorrow, uh, MagSafe to be added, HDMI ports, SD card readers, M1X 10 core SOCs, and obviously like blazing fast performance because these are gonna have between 16 and 32 graphics cores too. So between two and four times what you get in an M1. Now in terms of dates that these could be coming, Mark Gurman has said that there are no major Apple product announcements due for the next several weeks. Now, several is another one of those very vague terms, and I see that Mark Gurman actually uses a lot of vague terms when he's predicting things. He says, as soon as the summer, which could mean WWDC, and he would get a nice little tick on Apple Track, or it could mean in July, and he gets a nice little tick on Apple Track, or in August, and he gets a nice little tick on Apple Track. And I think anything before the 21st of September counts as summer. So he'd still get his nice little tick on Apple Track. I think this is the reason that we have a difference in the accuracy ratings for people like Mark Gurman and John Prosser, because John Prosser will put a date on it and say, this is when you are getting stuff. And Mark Gurman will say, summer. Ming-Chi Kuo does very similar things, gives very broad estimates of when things will happen. Whereas John gets apparently quite specific detail and gives you the specific detail. Now, when he hits, it's a much more impressive hit than what Mark Gurman does, but then Mark Gurman, because he is more vague, sits around 90% accuracy, and John Prosser is around 73, I think, at last check on Apple Track. But there we go, that's what we have. So, what does several weeks mean? I would, I would say three. I don't know, let me know down in the comments what your interpretation of several weeks is. Uh, but if it means three, which is what I would put my money on, that brings us to about the 20th of July, which I think feels like a date that we've mentioned in the past. Maybe. So am I confident that we'll get MacBooks on that date? I'm not confident, but I think it would be pretty awesome if we did, because I don't think anyone else has mentioned this 20th of July date before. Okay, let's get into some setups. We have Team Kinetics tweeted me his setup. At iCave Dave, here is my messy setup with an 11-inch M1 iPad Pro plugged into a Dell WD19TB Thunderbolt dock, catchy name, 24-inch monitor, uh, three external storage drives, keyboard and mouse pad, as well as speakers, all ready for my 14-inch M1X MacBook Pro when they eventually appear. So thank you very much for that one, Team Kinetics. I really uh, like what you've done here, and it does look like you're kind of using your iPad as a stand-in at the moment. Um, but I, I like the I like the vibe. Um, how are you finding using the external display with your iPad? I know it's not the most ideal situation because, uh, as we've said before, it's a tricky thing to use an external display with a touchscreen when the display doesn't have touchscreen because it's hard to interact with. 
So it does make a great viewer for things like video editing and if you just want to kind of throw your videos up on a bigger screen, but it's not super productive at this point. Um, looking forward to seeing your update once you've got that M1X MacBook Pro in there. And next up, Lars Anderson. Hi, Dave. This is Lars Anderson from Denmark. Thank you for delivering videos with high quality content. Keep up the good work. It's always important to flatter me as a part of your message. Here is my setup. The setup's gone through a few stages since I bought it a year ago. The first picture is the oldest, which is the one on the screen now, and the last picture is the newest. If you look closely, nearly all my devices have become flowers by now. Yep, I'm happily married. I guess the next surprise will be a huge flower pot in the middle of the desk instead of my computer when I come home from work someday. This is the setup you see in the last picture. MacBook Pro, uh, Mac Pro 2013, 64GB of RAM, 4 cores Xeon, 4 cores Xeon, 512GB SSD with dual AMD Fire Pro D700s. And I'm looking for a 6 or 8 core CPU with a faster SSD slash M.2 drive. 27 inch Apple Thunderbolt display, Sennheiser HD 800S headphones, Aeon X7S headphone amp, and I need a DAC also. So thanks to Lars for sharing that. If you want to share one of your setups on our show in the future, all you need to do is you can either email me at david at sangwells.co.uk or you can uh, tweet me your pictures and your setup details, iCave underscore Dave on Twitter. And let's get into some iCave answers. Again, this is uh, the place where you can ask me any questions you want about anything Apple. And we've got a video one in the middle, so we'll get into some of the regular ones, and then the video, and then back to the regular ones. First up, Mark Livingston. Hi Dave, when do you think we'll see ARM V9 based Apple Silicon? And thank you for the hashtag notification squad. Um, we forgot, we, we haven't done this for a little while, but if you want to join the notification squad, just uh, subscribe to the channel and ring the bell so that you can then post up hashtag notification squad in the comments and you will get a shout out for being in the squad. So on V9, it's a, a difficult one to say because uh, Apple already includes a lot of the features that have come to ARM V9. Apple doesn't use a pure ARM V8 architecture for their chips. They basically use ARM V8 at the moment as kind of the basis and then they've added a lot of their own features and their own instructions to it. So we're not gonna see a a kind of now Apple is using ARM V9 kind of cutoff point. Um, a lot of the stuff that would be coming with ARM V9 is already integrated, especially from the security side of things. Um, there might be some performance enhancements to come, uh, but I would think it's probably not going to be on this year's chips unless Apple did get early access, because I believe it was... Uh, released around about March this year from memory. So I doubt that Apple would have integrated it if they were waiting until March to see it. So I would guess a 16 generation, which would be M3, but it's possible because Apple was a founding member of ARM that they did get early access, in which case it could be coming in A15. The Duke of Kidderminster asks, IK answers, do you think that Apple will release a touchscreen MacBook? So I definitely thought when we were looking at uh, what was happening with Big Sur and the way that everything was redesigned and a lot of other YouTubers thought this too that Apple was approaching kind of a touchable interface with that and it could be that they're making it a little bit more touchable ready for sidecar and things like that. Now I'm not convinced that Apple will move over to touchscreen on MacBooks and the reason for that is that it doesn't make sense across the whole product line. Now Apple's done the right thing, I think, by having the iPads for touch and the MacBooks for not touch for keyboard and mouse interface because it means you can optimize the whole setup to be specifically for that. Now, what Windows 11 has just done is had an interface that kind of adjusts itself. It makes the touch targets bigger when you fold away your keyboard and things like that. But I don't see Apple making an, a MacBook where you would fold away the keyboard, so it wouldn't have an opportunity to change from one to the other. And also people that are using Windows laptops as uh, a two-in-one or using them using the touchscreen don't tend to fold away the keyboard before they touch the screen. So it means that you get a really kind of janky middle ground that isn't great for either. So I like the fact that we have iPads with touchscreens and MacBooks with uh, keyboard and mouse first. I wouldn't be upset if they added touchscreen to the MacBook. I don't know how much more useful it would be. And next up, a video question from Team Kinetics, so I'll let him take it away. Hashtag iCave answers. 
Hey Dave, with the rumoured M1X MacBook Pros due to be bringing back some legacy ports, are there any other features that you'd like to see that Apple have scrapped in the past that they could bring back to any future products? Anyway, really enjoying the show. Thanks a lot. So yeah, the uh, the legacy ports coming back to... We call them legacy ports, but they're still very current ports in these cases. Legacy ports would be really going back to USB-A, which I don't see Apple doing. I don't think we're even going to see USB-A on the updated Mac Minis when they come out. And that's currently, I think, the only Mac... Of, of current design language that you can get it on. I know you can still get it on the um, the 27 inch iMacs, but I would say that those are basically on their way out quite quickly. So Mac mini is kind of the last stalwart of USB A at this point. In terms of stuff I would like to see them bring back, um, definitely the floppy drive. I think that's important, but there's really not a great deal. When you look back at, at previous Apple products, um, one thing I would like to come back is uh, a version of the iSight camera. So, because I use Mac Mini, um, I don't get a webcam. I don't get a FaceTime camera on my Mac. So I would love to see them bring back something like the iSight camera that could sit on top of whatever display you had. It could be uh, an improved version, maybe a 4K camera that you could use on top of any MacBook. You could use on top of whatever display you had with a Mac Mini. Um, and it basically gave you a really high quality version of a webcam that you could use for video calls, for content creation, and that kind of thing. I think that would be great. Um, maybe even focus it on live streaming and social media stuff. I think that would be quite cool. Um, and obviously not using its own display or anything, but purely a webcam that could sit on top of your dis uh, display and give you a much better picture. Because everyone's been complaining for years about how bad they are in MacBooks. Why not just give people the opportunity to upgrade that camera? Martin Kowalczyk. IK answers. I wonder if Apple would ever consider hiring a leaker to stop the leaks and gain an asset instead. Okay, so it's an interesting one, but you have to remember that the majority of these leaks are actually coming from inside Apple. They are Apple employees. This is why Apple is now requiring many of their employees to wear um, body cams uh, in kind of a police enforcement kind of thing. And I'm not sure if it's designed for the individual that is leaking to sort of catch themselves with these body cams or if it's if everyone's got body cameras on that it's easier to spot someone else that's uh, taking photos on personal devices and that kind of thing. I don't see that there would be any advantage to Apple for hiring a leaker. I, I think maybe if John Prosser was hired as head of PR, that might work. Yeah, so I don't really see what the uh, what the game would be for Apple for hiring a leaker because um, basically all Apple wants is them to not leak stuff <laughs> that they shouldn't have. Swilamek asks, talk of Risk Five has been circulating in the news lately, and with Intel planning a seven nanometer CPU to rival ARM. Could you share your thoughts on this open source architecture and should Apple even consider jumping on board? Okay, so I'm not 100% sure, like I'm not a systems architect, so I don't have a huge amount of detail on this. But remember that Apple is using their own instruction set, as we've said about uh, ARM. The big advantage with RISC-V is really the fact that it's open source uh, and that doesn't give a massive advantage to Apple. Um, Risk five means that uh, you don't have to license the architecture like you would with um, x86 or with ARM. Both of those you would need a license and licenses run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So if you're making a fridge, for example, and you need a microcontroller that can do something specific, uh, you wouldn't necessarily want to license um, ARM or x86 to run that because you also probably don't need that amount of capacity. Now, with Intel looking at doing this on a 7 nanometer process, uh, my first thoughts were good luck. You don't seem to have been very good at shrinking your nodes so far. Um, but it might be that they're getting this uh, produced for them by TSMC rather than making it on their own fabs. We also don't know what they're going to run on this because at the moment uh, ARM has a version of Windows that runs on it and uh, macOS runs on ARM and x86. There's, there's not a great deal of software at the moment, as far as I'm aware, that runs uh, natively on RISC-V. So that could be a little bit of a stumbling block for them, um, because they would need Windows, for example, to make a RISC version of Windows 
if that's what they wanted to do. And then you've got the difficulties of having a third platform and developers needing to um, code for multiple platforms. I don't see that it's going to be a huge deal. It's not going to be around until about 2023 at the very earliest. Um, but based on the way that Intel has developed their nodes in the past, 7 nanometers should be here probably by around 2050. And Yuri Tech asks, do you think it will be the end of Apple leaking because Apple lawyers telling leakers, leakers to stop leaking Apple products? It's a tricky one. Um, this is a kind of new new era, I guess, in terms of Apple news and Apple leaking. Uh, it's not super exciting for me that, uh, that all of the leaks are going to stop happening, maybe. But I do respect what Apple's doing. Like, their job is to crack down on their information leaving early. They want to be able to surprise and delight people. They want the events to be exciting. Like, it's no fun when everything gets leaked like two hours before the event because, you know, we were just sitting here to watch it. There's no real gain by doing it. Um, but as John Prosser himself has said, that most of the people that are leaking this stuff to him are Apple employees who are just really excited about the products they're working on and they want that little thrill of knowing that uh, this news cycle that's going on is because of stuff that they told someone. Um, so I don't see that it's going to stop completely. I can just see that it's going to slow down. Um, as we've said with this channel in the past, we are kind of speculative here. So we will take the tidbits of leaks and news that we see and talk about what Apple could do with that. What would be great if Apple did with that? What could this mean for future products? We're not really trying to leak. I mean, we, we don't leak at all. We report on news that's out there. Uh, I don't have direct sources. I don't have anyone that works at Apple that's talking to me. That's not what we do. I report on the stuff that comes out and we talk about what could that mean. Yeah, you know, we talked about the Apple Silicon timeline when we thought we would see all of the different products because of what makes sense with previous um, releases and release cycles. And I think we've been fairly accurate. I mean, we've not got all the dates right, but we've got the dates vaguely right. So I thought that the new iMac would come out in the spring. I said March, but I said March in October because that tends to be when Apple does their education push and stuff like that. It came out in April. It looks like they wanted to bring it out in March, but there were some delays. So I think logically we do quite well on this channel um, in terms of taking the information that is out there and uh, making a narrative from it. Um, I don't think that it's going to be the end of leaks because there's always going to be supply chain. There's always going to be some information coming out from China and from Taiwan and from Vietnam and now India and all of the other places where Apple is uh, constructing their products. So there will always be stuff. We might not see stuff as far out as we have done in the past, but there's still going to be the interesting parts of this company is doing an IPO. They make this kind of sensor and they've listed Apple as their main customer. And currently we haven't seen anything from them in Apple products. You know, there's things like that with the next Apple Watch that's coming. So there's always going to be information that gets out. But I doubt that we're going to see schematics like we saw for the MacBook Pros. And David Black asks, iCave answers, this is a more speculative out there question. But what is the understood theoretical limit as regards thinness in nanometer terms for the M chips uh, manufacturing process? appreciating that the current M1 chip is around 5 nanometers. And as those limits are explored, what possible gains do even thinner M-class chips bring in terms of performance and power efficiency? So yeah, the theoretical limit, as far as I'm aware, is somewhere between 3 and 2 nanometers, which is at what point you start to get quantum tunneling effects coming in, uh, which basically means that the electrons kind of exist in multiple positions at the same time, which they already do, but if you start getting closer together, wave wave particle duality and all of that sort of stuff that gets quite messy at the, uh, the quantum level um, starts to make your processes fail a bit more often. Uh, you start to get more kind of noise added to the signal. As far as I understand, that's that's kind of where the limit comes. So you start to get more interference that you have to kind of phase out, which then means that you're spending computing time on cleaning up what's coming out. They're going to have to find their performance boosts from elsewhere other than making the process smaller. Um, the transistors themselves that are uh, at this scale 
is ridiculous. Uh, I think two nanometers uh, or three nanometers or five nanometers describes the gate size in these in these transistors. As I say, I'm not an expert in this, but I think we've probably got maybe seven more years of improvements due to scale, and then we will probably have to go to a new process or some kind of new technology that gives us a different way to get those gains. Or we go to bigger dies, or we find better ways of cooling stuff. So there's there's a few different uh, options for how they can find improvements still. But yes, there is a limit that we are coming up to. And I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see like two and a half nanometer nodes or, you know, the increments becoming smaller as we go down. Because we went from 10 to 7 to 5 to 4 to 3 to maybe two and a half. Maybe that's where we go next. And then to two. And then at that point, we've had the best part of a decade where we can potentially find some new ways to... Uh, to mitigate the quantum issues, perhaps. But on that theoretical and philosophical note, thank you all for watching. Please do submit your setups and your questions for the next show in the ways that I told you earlier. Twitter, email, david at sangwells.co.uk. Search me on Twitter, you'll find me. Thanks so much for watching.